The book of the prophet Isaiah. In the first video, we explored chapters 1 to 39, which was Isaiah's message of judgment and hope for Jerusalem. He accused Israel's leaders of rebellion against God and said that through Assyria and then Babylon, Israel's kingdom would come crashing down in an act of God's judgment. And so chapter 39 concluded with Isaiah predicting Jerusalem's fall to Babylon and the exile. And a hundred years after Isaiah, it all sadly came to pass. But Isaiah's greater hope was for a new purified Jerusalem where God's kingdom would be restored through the future messianic king and all nations would come together in peace. And so chapters 40 and following explore this great hope. The first main section, chapters 40 to 48, open with an announcement of hope and comfort for Israel. The people are told that the Babylonian exile is over and that Israel's sin has been dealt with, a new era is beginning. So they should all return home to Jerusalem where God himself will bring his kingdom and all nations will see his glory. Now, let's stop for a moment because this opening announcement raises a big question, that is, who is saying all of this? Whose voice are we hearing in these words of hope? The perspective of the prophet in these chapters is that of somebody who's living after the exile, in other words, in the time period described by Ezra and Nehemiah. But Isaiah died 150 years before any of that. So what are we supposed to make of this? Well, there are many who think that it's still Isaiah in his own day speaking, but that he's been prophetically transported, so to speak, 200 years into the future, and that he's speaking to the future generations as if the exile is past. However, the book of Isaiah itself gives us some clues that something else is probably going on. In chapters 8 and 29 and 30, we're told that after Isaiah was rejected by Israel's leaders, that he wrote and sealed up in a scroll all of his messages of judgment and hope, and that he passed it on to his disciples as a witness for days to come. Eventually, Isaiah died, waiting for God to vindicate his words. Now, remember, chapters 1 to 39 were designed to show us that Isaiah's predictions of judgment were fulfilled in the exile. He's a true prophet. And so after exile is over, Isaiah's disciples, who have treasured his words for so long, open up the scroll and begin applying his words of hope to their own day. So on this view, the book of Isaiah consists of that first collection of Isaiah's words, as well as the writings of his prophetic disciples that God uses to extend Isaiah's message of hope to future generations. Whichever view you end up taking, everybody agrees that these chapters are announcing that the future hope has come, that God is fulfilled filling Isaiah's prophetic promises. And so the prophet hopes that Israel will respond by becoming God's servant. That is, after experiencing God's justice and mercy through history, that they will now begin to share with the nations who God truly is. But that's not what's happening. Israel, instead of bearing witness to the nations, is actually complaining and even accusing God. They say, the Lord doesn't pay attention to our trouble. In fact, he's ignoring our cause. The Babylonian exile, understandably, caused Israel to lose faith in their God. I mean, maybe he's not that powerful. Maybe the gods of Babylon are way greater than our God. And so the rest of these chapters, 41 to 47, are set up like a trial scene. God is responding to these doubts and accusations with the following arguments. He says first that the exile to Babylon was not divine neglect. Rather, it was divinely orchestrated as a judgment for Israel's sin. And second, it was for Israel's sake that God raised up Persia to conquer Babylon so they could come back home fulfilling Isaiah's words. So the right conclusion that Israel should draw is that their God is the king of history, not the idols of the nations. In the fall of Babylon and the rise of the Persian king Cyrus, Israel should see God's hand at work and so become his servant, telling the nations who he is. But by the end of the trial, chapter 48, we find that Israel is still as rebellious and hard-hearted as their ancestors. And so God disqualifies them as his servant, but God still is on a mission to bless the nations. And so the prophet says God's going to do a new thing to solve this problem, which moves into the next section, 49 to 55. We're introduced to a figure who's called God's servant, who's going to fulfill God's mission and do what Israel has failed to do. God gives this servant the title Israel and sends this person on a mission to, first of all, restore the people of Israel back to their God, but second, to become God's light to the nations. And we're told that this servant is empowered by God's spirit to announce good news and to bring God's kingdom over all of the nations. It sounds just like the Messianic king from chapters 9 and 11. But then we learn the surprising way of how the servant will bring God's kingdom. 
he's going to be rejected and beaten and ultimately killed by his own people. In reality, as he's being accused and sentenced to death, he's dying on behalf of the sin of his own people. The prophet says the servant's death is a sacrifice of atonement for the people's evil and rebellion. Isaiah chapter 50 verses 5 to 9 I gave my back to those who struck me. The Lord opened my ear. I did not refuse, did not turn away. I gave my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who tore out my beard, my face I did not hide from insults and spitting. The Lord God is my help, therefore I am not disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, knowing that I shall not be put to shame. He is near, who upholds my right. If anyone wishes to oppose me, let us appear together. Who disputes my right, let him confront me. See, the Lord God is my help. Who will prove me wrong? Lo, they will all wear out like cloth. The moth will eat them up. This reading is often referred to as a servant song, a servant who willingly accepts his afflictions because of his confidence in God. In the Old Testament, slaves could not be kept for more than six years, but the slave could become a bond slave, a slave by choice, if he chose to remain with his master. After making the choice to be a bond slave in all a metal pointed instrument was driven through his earlobe and a gold ring would be placed in the hole. In verses 5 and 6, the servant declares obedience and faithfulness to God. In verses 7 to 9, the servant tells us that his faith in God will save him. He is so confident he says, I have set my face like flint. The servant's faith is as unbreakable as flint, but his adversaries are like old cloth, infested with moths. The cloth's time is short, but the servant's time is eternal. The cloth will be eaten up by the moths who represent sin, but the righteous will be saved from destruction by God who forgives and removes sin if asked. We can apply this Old Testament reading to the New Testament life of Jesus. Jesus didn't rebel against his father. Matthew chapter 26 verse 39. He advanced a little and fell prostrate in prayer, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. John chapter 8 verse 29. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone because I always do what is pleasing to him. Jesus was beaten, mocked, and never lost confidence in God. Matthew 26 verse 67 Then they spat in his face and struck him, and some slapped him. Christ's enemies, the religious leaders, were like old cloth. Matthew 12 verse 14 But the Pharisees went out and took counsel against him to put him to death. They, like the cloth, were consumed by their own sin. He has heard my voice in supplication because he has inclined his ear to me the day I called. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. The 
cords of death encompassed me. The snares of the netherworld seized upon me. I fell into distress and sorrow, and I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, save my life. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Gracious is the Lord and just. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord keeps the little ones. I was brought low, and He saved me. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living, for He has freed my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I shall walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the Psalm 116, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I love the Lord who listens to my voice in supplication, who turned an ear to me on the day I called. I was caught by the cords of death. The snares of Sheol had seized me. I felt agony and dread. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and just. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord protects the simple. I was helpless, but God saved me. For my soul has been freed from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I shall walk before the Lord in the land of the living. This psalm is a unique expression of love and trust in the Lord. The psalmist tells us about his deliverance by the Lord because he had almost died. He tells us that the Lord is merciful and compassionate, who protects the simple, the humble, the innocent, and the helpless. God has delivered him from his near-death experience so that he could go on to live a peaceful and tranquil life of service to others. God delivers those in need so that they have another chance to walk obediently before him on their journey to the land of the living, heaven. James chapter 2 verses 14 to 18. Faith, if it does not have works, is dead. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister has nothing to wear and has no food for the day, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat well, but you do not give them the necessities of the body, what good is it? So also faith of itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Indeed, someone might say, You have faith and I have works. Demonstrate your faith to me without works, and I will demonstrate my faith to you from my works. Can we be saved by faith alone? No. The concept of being saved by faith alone began with Martin Luther in 1517. It was condemned by the Council of Trent because it clearly contradicted Scripture. Luther's open letter on translating was written in 1530. In his letter, Luther attempts to defend his having added the word alone to Romans 3 verse 28. 
His defense is primarily his claim that faith alone was clearly what St. Paul intended to say. So Luther says his translation simply clarifies St. Paul's thinking. It's important to note that Luther claims that he knew exactly what St. Paul's intention was. During the preceding 1500 years, no one else had even attempted to claim he knew what St. Paul wanted to say, and thus give themselves permission to change his words. Only Luther did that. In this, as in other matters of doctrine, Luther would accept no authority except his own. In his letter on translating, he told his followers how to respond to Catholics who criticized him for adding the word alone. Tell them, he said, Dr. Martin Luther will have it so, and he says that a papist and a donkey are the same thing. Again, he instructed his fellow believers to say to his critics, Luther will have it so, and he says that he is a doctor, that is, theologian, above all doctors of the Pope. He was very adept at vilifying his Catholic critics. In attempting to justify Luther's editorial handiwork, Lutheran apologists listed several writers before Luther's time who also inserted the word alone as he did. But of course, the errors of others could not justify Luther's error. You may recall that Luther denied the epistle of James as inspired scripture. His reason, James 2.17, declares that faith without works is dead. Read his own remarks about this biblical book in his preface to the epistle of St. James and St. Jude, where he rejects the book's apostolic authority and declares, I will not have it, this epistle, in my Bible to be numbered among the true chief books. Apparently, Luther would have liked to remove this epistle of straw, as he termed it, from the canon altogether, but he did not quite dare. Again, in St. James chapter 2, verse 26, he reaffirms what he said in 2.17. Faith, apart from works, is dead. Luther's concept of faith was that all man's sins have been forgiven by God when Christ died on the cross. If that were so, why did St. Peter and others call for continuing the need to turn away from sin and repent? Think of it this way. If all your sins had been forgiven when Christ was on the cross, then why can't you live any way you want without fear of hell or eternal damnation? The Bible clearly says that hell exists, but if all your sins are forgiven, how then could anyone go to hell. Faith implies the acceptance of all of God's revelation found in God's Word, and eternal damnation is in the Bible. Faith necessarily leads to doing good. Jesus modeled his faith and good works his entire life on earth. Except in the cross of our Lord, through which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. Alleluia, Alleluia,
Jesus and his disciples set out for the villages of Caesarea Philippi. Along the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? They said in reply, John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter said to him in reply, You are the Christ. Then he warned them not to tell anyone about him. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and rise after three days. He spoke this openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. At this he turned around, looking at his disciples, rebuked Peter, and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are thinking not as God does, but as human beings do. He summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, Whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and that of the gospel will save it. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 35. You are the Christ. Caesarea is a Latin word meaning emperor. Caesarea Philippi was the name given to the city by Philip II, son of Herod the Great. He used his own name to distinguish this city from Caesarea on the seacoast, which was the seat of the Roman government. Today, the city is no longer inhabited but is an archaeological site located within the Golan Heights. Jesus asked his disciples, Who do people say I am? But why would he ask that? He wanted to know if the people had discovered for themselves who he really was. Peter says, You are the Messiah. The word Messiah is a Hebrew word, and Christ is the equivalent in Greek. Both mean anointed one. Jesus then tells the disciples not to tell anyone that he is the Messiah. Jesus immediately begins telling about his coming rejection, death, and resurrection in order to prepare the disciples for what will happen. Peter doesn't like what he hears. He, like many others, are seeking a Messiah who would lead Israel out of their Roman domination. Then he decided to rebuke or criticize the man he had just identified as the Messiah. Jesus didn't meet Peter's expectations of the Messiah, so Jesus pointed out that what humans want was not necessarily what God has planned. God wants human beings to totally trust the suffering Messiah, or on Judgment Day, they open themselves up for an unfavorable judgment. Mark chapter 8 verse 38. Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this faithless and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of when he comes into his Father's glory with the holy angels. Now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi, and on the road he asked his disciples, Who do men say that I am? John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan! For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men.
When he had called the people to himself, with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Well, hello there, Father Francis here with you on this 24th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Wow, well here I am, I'm, I'm up here in the beautiful God's country, as I affectionately like to call the Highlands. Uh, it is Thursday, I believe it's September 13th, so I normally try to start putting my thoughts together by Wednesday. I start to try to get an idea of what I want to say uh, to the parish on the weekend. And um, But I have to tell you that although I had another idea for a little bit more of a formal homily, I um, needed to just kind of get away. And it's such a beautiful autumn day today. Uh, this Thursday on the 13th of September and although autumn hasn't officially begun it is it's getting real close and I have to tell you autumn is probably well I mean I like I enjoy all the seasons but for some reason I just have a real affinity for autumn and I don't know why that is uh, I speculate because it seems like it is uh, I remember a guy named Leo Buscaglia who talked about that autumn was that season that reminded us that uh, yes life is is not permanent it is ephemeral but it also reminds us that we can also always go out in a great blaze of glory and and I really hold that kind of sentiment in my my heart and in my spirit that we all know that um, you know we do have expiration dates as human beings and one day we will you know we will let we'll, we'll lay this uh, mor mortality down and and hopefully we will uh, be reborn again uh, into the e e eternal spirit of Christ, his resurrection spirit. So, you know, the thing is that, um, so autumn is just a really beautiful time of year. The temperatures are gorgeous this time of year. It's like 66 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm up here on Highway 32, kind of almost on the summit here. It's just gorgeous, just beautiful, it's just a beautiful day today. So as I was driving up here, I started thinking about what I wanted to preach upon this weekend. And uh, and it just dawned on me that, um, that maybe uh, I would like to focus on, you know, the idea of, 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 you know, kind of escaping into the beauty of God's, uh, God's creation, the beautiful forest here. But yet there's a, I wanna compare and contrast the forest and the beauty of the forest with also the danger of forest fires. Um, you know, it says, I will walk with the Lord in the land of the living. I think that's the uh, the responsorial psalm. Now I'm kind of doing this from memory. Um, and I want to maybe focus on that to, to basically walk with the Lord in the land of the living. Um, because that's really important. Because the message I wanted to talk about this Sunday was about faith. You see, in the aftermath of this horrible scandal, and it seems like um, for some reason the world and the secular media are just really, they've got the church on the ropes and they're just pummeling the church. Now, please don't hear me saying that, you know, we're not guilty, uh, that bishops and priests aren't guilty of these egregious crimes. Of course, some are. Some are. But to use this as a club to bludgeon the church is, is really sad. And a lot of people uh, who have truly been hurt and harmed and victimized, yes, they are totally scandalized. And some of them uh, have lost their faith or maybe they're really, really, really trying to do uh, a great deal of soul searching to say, what you know, what is this that I really say, supposedly believe about this Catholic faith, about even this man, Jesus? And yet there are a lot of other people, you know, in the military, when you, um, you know, sad to say when you're at war and uh, you, uh, you bomb somebody, but you don't intend to bomb some other group of people that were close by, you call that 
you know, collateral damage, you know, that's a, a euphemism that the military uses. But basically you're saying, well, we didn't intend to hurt these people. You know, we, we, didn't, we intended to kill these people over here, but we didn't really intend to hurt these people that did get hurt inevitably. So there's a collateral damage, or maybe, maybe you would call it friendly fire. That's another euphemism, you know, where uh, uh, your uh, one set of troops uh, accidentally, you know, thinks that these other troops that are actually on your side are the bad guys, and you shoot them up, and they get killed or wounded or both. So they call that friendly fire. And in some ways, there is that sense of that's what's going on in the church, <clears throat> because there are the first line of people who have been truly victimized and and uh, molested but then there's a i think a greater uh subset of people who have been scandalized to the point of they're just they're probably ready to just cash in their chips and walk away and i understand that um so i was thinking about as i was driving up here and i was looking at this beautiful you know the beautiful forest up here this is i guess the last national forest up here just absolutely gorgeous and you know as I drive up here, I say, wow, I, I feel so invigorated when I come up here. Uh, I spend, you know, a lot of most of my weekdays in downtown Chico and, you know, and I, I like Chico. Chico's a, a kind of a really nice place to live. It really is. But to get up here away from it all and just be able to breathe in the beautiful air, get the beautiful sunlight, it's, wow, it's really invigorating. But as I was driving up here, I realized that you know, and I guess a number of years ago, there was a forest fire up here that devastated part of Forest Ranch and Highway 32. And, and certainly it could happen again. And I started thinking about that, that, you know, um, a forest can be really invigorating and inspiring and refreshing uh, and uh, all those wonderful things that you do when you come and get into nature, allow nature to just, you know, refresh you. But the other side of nature can also be, it can be dangerous. There can be horrible forest fires that, that destroy life and property. So on the one hand, you have this great beauty of the forest, but it could also turn into a blazing inferno, which would also be terrifying at the same time. And I kind of think that that's where the church is right now. You know, there are people that probably, um, you know, look at the church right now and they're bewildered, they're confused, they're upset, they're, they're scandalized, they're angry because of what has happened. And yet other people can probably say, well, yeah, but I, st I still believe in God, you know, um, you know, you can still see the, the beauty, hopefully, uh, in the church, the beauty of the liturgy, the beauty of the sacraments, the beauty of God's mercy and forgiveness. Uh, you can see the beauty in the people of God as they, as they, as they come together, even in the midst of sorrow and grief and loss and shame and scandal. They still come together. Um, they still reach out to others who are broken, you know, in their own, maybe not their own individual brokenness, but in their corporate brokenness. You know, we're told that if one member of the body suffers, we all suffer. So, you know, maybe you can see the beauty in people rebuilding, you know, uh, this beautiful uh, church. Uh, that I uh, am kind of loosely affiliated with, the Greek-Ukrainian Catholic Church, uh, St. Elias in Brampton, Ontario. Uh, they had a tragedy, a great tragedy, three years ago, maybe four years ago now, uh, the Holy Week. Their beautiful, beautiful Byzantine church burnt to the ground, burnt to the ground by a simple accident. Uh, I guess what I was told was that somebody had left uh, an incensor, a thurible, and they didn't empty it out properly, and it was it was still burning. The embers were still burning in the thurible, and it caught uh, it caught fire. And unfortunately, because it's a wood, mostly a wood structure, it went up like a, a house of uh, matches. And that happened a week before Easter, you know. And they were heartbroken. They were devastated. And yet, uh, they came back together 
and rebuilt. And now St. Elias is, uh, it's been restored to its former glory and probably will even become even, even more greater uh, in, through that, through the ashes, through the brokenness in the ashes. And so I was thinking that in many ways, you know, Dostoevsky says that beauty will save the world. And I believe that the beauty of the church will save our souls. And so what we have to do, and this is hard, it's not, it's not easy, but we have to begin to separate the individuals who have done these horrible, ugly, egregious crimes from the beauty of the church. Uh, because it just like this forest here is green, it's verdant, it's refreshing, it's life-giving. Uh, and just like that, there are other churches. Uh, when I talk about churches, I mean other, you know, uh, congregations of Catholics and Christians. And, you know, they maybe haven't been scathed, yet they pray and they are they in sorrow. They're united in their sorrows with those that have been. But they look upon and say, well, at least, you know, our church is is still a place of beauty, a place of of, of refreshment, a place of healing that we can go to. And although some of these uh, priests and bishops who have done these things, uh, you know, shame on them, shame on those individuals, especially because it has brought great scandal to the body of Christ, the church. And yet most of us would probably realize like, just like this forest here, are there other forests that have been burnt to cinders and they're they're, they're, they're barren wastelands now, and, you know, yes, there are. But at least this beautiful part of the forest still stands, and it still can be a place of sanctuary. It can be a place of, of, of beauty and peace and, and recreation, recreation even. And so you still have to hold on to the good, even in the midst of the bad. And uh, I was going to close it with this one little interesting statement. I'll try to get a picture of it on the way back. On the way into the forest, there's a sign that says, don't get lost in the woods or don't get lost in the forest. Help us find you. And I kind of thought that that might be an appropriate way of looking at people who are really scandalized right now by the, by the horrible crimes that have happened in the church. Because sometimes people do get lost. They lose their faith. And uh, what I'd want to say is, you know, don't let this don't get lost in the in the ugliness and the and the debris and the destruction of all of this you know you know if, if necessary reach out to somebody you know help us find you don't be lost in the woods if it will don't be lost in the in the darkness because um, you know there is beauty beauty is still real and uh, God is still real Jesus uh, loving us back into um, even the wounded body, you know, it's all, he is real. Uh, he's real in the sacraments. He's real, speak, speaks his words to us in the scriptures. And so we have to basically uh, maybe get back to basics, get back to basics and just, uh, you know, allow God to lead us into, uh, you know, a new forest, where there's life and there's goodness and there's beauty and there's light and there's, you know, new life. Uh, because it does exist. It is, it, it, it is, in other words, it, you know, just because of some individuals, it hasn't, it hasn't destroyed the church. You know, just like one forest fire. Yes, it can devastate a region, you know, without a doubt, but it doesn't destroy all the forests in the world. In fact, the the forests that are burnt, uh, they even grow back uh, sometimes, even more spectacularly than they were before. Again, that's not to make light of or dismiss or uh, minimize the the, the uh, horrible the horrible crimes that have happened. But but there is, you know, there's always there's always a Good Friday, but Good Friday is always followed by an Easter Sunday. So today, you know, if uh, you're going through questioning your faith, you're kind of wondering, what's this all about, this Christianity, this Catholic Catholicism? Do I really want to be here? You know, maybe it's time that you kind of look for, you know, the greener, 
forests because they still exist. They're out there. Um, maybe you have to kind of, you know, travel to where they are. But again, know that uh, life life is 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 still here. You know, it's not it's not totally destroyed. I guess that would be the message I say is, you know, you know, and, and don't allow uh, the media, the secular media, don't allow the, the scandals and the crimes of some individuals to rob you of your faith. Don't get lost in the ugliness that we're kind of going through right now. You know, help us find you, you know, um, reach out, you know, talk to somebody, you know, spend time with the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, you know, soon will be in October, the month of Mary, the month of the Rosary, Our Lady of the Rosary, you know, also the month of our guardian angels, you know, really ask God to really, you know, bring healing to your heart, your mind and your soul, because he will, he will, that's his promise. And so again, I, I know I've probably gone a little too long. I normally don't do that, but I, I just wanted to kind of share this little message more than more of a formal homily uh, this weekend, because I think it's, it might be a little bit more meaningful to, to more people because it's just more of a it's more of a sharing than a preaching okay so thank you for watching god bless you and keep you this week and uh may god bless you father son holy spirit amen 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 thanks for watching hi welcome to holy hero sunday gospel video this sunday is the 24th sunday in ordinary time this Sunday's Gospel is from Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 to 35. Jesus and his disciples set out for the villages of Caesarea Philippi. Along the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? They said in reply, John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter said to him in reply, You are the Christ. Then he warned them not to tell anyone about him. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and raised after three days. He spoke this openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. At this he turned around and, looking at his disciples, rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are thinking not as God does, but as human beings do. He summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, Whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and that of the gospel will save it. Sometimes we can question things God does in our lives. Maybe we prayed for something and we didn't get it. It can be very easy to question God's intentions and plans for our life. Jesus reminds us never to doubt God because we are not thinking as God does, but as human beings do. He only allows what is best for us. Bye! See you next time! Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, on the 24th Sunday of the year, the evangelist Mark invites us to reflect about the identity of Jesus. Mark makes us to reflect about the identity of Jesus through a question raised by Jesus himself. Jesus asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? The disciples answered him saying, Some say you are John the Baptist. Others say you are Elijah or one of the prophets. When Jesus asked the same question to his disciples, Who do you say that I am? Peter answers him, You are the Christ. By the fact that Jesus did not ask any more question about his identity, reveals that he was happy with the answer given by Peter. It is good for us to reflect why Jesus was satisfied with the answer of Peter. 
our limited understanding makes us to affirm that Jesus is a prophet like John the Baptist and Elijah. But Jesus is someone greater than the prophets. He is the Christ, the anointed one, the son of God. The answer of Peter that Jesus is the Christ makes Jesus an indispensable part of our life because we who are creatures do not have existence without Jesus who is the son of God. The question that Jesus asked the disciples he poses before us today who do we say that Jesus is? We can give different answers and perhaps all of them right. but the perfect answer would be the answer given by peter it is important to have the right answer because it expresses our belief system and our beliefs will always determine our lifestyle our faith will always express itself in corresponding action if our answer is wrong or partial our lifestyle too can be faulty or one sided this is the truth that the second reading of today taken from the letter of St James confirms St James states that our faith cannot be devoid of good works if our faith is not accompanied by works it is dead the focal point of how faith leads to consequent lifestyle is very clear in the conversation that follows between Jesus and Peter Peter was happy that he could give the right answer to Jesus about his identity Though he gave the right answer he had a wrong idea about Christ he perhaps thought of a triumphant and glorious Christ who would destroy the enemies and establish the kingdom of God on the contrary Jesus expressed the true identity of Christ as someone who has to suffer he would be rejected by the elders the chief priests and the scribes and he would be killed Peter could never accept a suffering Christ. He could never accept a weak Christ who would be put to death by the enemy. Can Peter began to rebuke Jesus and correct him? The response of Jesus to Peter's rebuke is very harsh. He calls Peter, "Get behind me, Satan." Jesus has never used the word Satan against anyone else. Jesus had enemies. There were people trying to plot against him and to get rid of him. Jesus as the son of God knew their plans, but he never addressed them as Satan. On the contrary, here is Jesus calling his dearest disciple Satan. What is the reason? The reason I believe is simple. How you believe so you be. If Peter were to believe in a glorious king Jesus he would also expect to be glorious in his way of life on the contrary the way of life shown by jesus is different a simple life a life of sacrifice a life of suffering a life of unconditional love this is the kind of life led by isaiah the suffering servant as we find in the first reading of today and dear friends let us get our faith and convictions corrected based on the life and teachings of jesus Let us get our thoughts enlightened and inspired because where our thoughts are there we are if we save our thoughts we we'll save ourselves We hear in the gospel today Jesus says get behind me satan You are not thinking as God does, but as human beings do. And so sometimes humans we tend to think without hope. We don't have the hope we should. Stresses, worldly anxieties sort of cloud our minds. I think about how I need to control things instead of the hope that waits for me that I could be with God forever. And so the word esperanza is hope in Spanish, and esperar, the verb that's the the root of it all. means to wait. And so what do I wait for? For whom do I wait? I work at a, a boarding school for trouble and abandoned youth in Mexico. And when I leave, or when the boys see me leave and even to just run an errand, they say, "Where are you going?" And then I tell them where I'm going. I'm going to the office. I'm going to run an errand. 
and they go, oh, that's right, we did have that errand to run, and then they all start to follow me. And sometimes they, <laughs> sometimes they win me over, and I do, I just take them with me. But we hear also in the Gospel, whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. When Christ tells us to follow him, he says, stay with me, be with me. His disciples stayed with him day and night, his apostles accompanied him everywhere. And if we can stay in his presence, then we will, we'll hope for good things. But when we leave the presence of our Lord, that's when the worldly anxieties and the stresses and the fears begin to come to us. And so this week, as we're praying, we should pray to stay in the presence of God. Because if we're, if we're with our Lord and we want to spend time with Him, we'll begin to have the same desires, the same hopes. And so we'll want the same things that God wants for us in our own lives. And then that way, the worldly stresses, the anxieties of everything won't creep into our prayer. And we'll be happy to be with Christ and remain with Him forever. That can't be taken And I have His Spirit here with me I have a faith that can't be shaken And I have a joy that can't be tamed I have a hope that can't be taken your spirit here with me I have a faith that can't be shaken I have a joy that can't be tamed Oh, what more could I gain? I will see the
We have all felt rejection at one time or another. Do you remember your greatest disappointment? Maybe as a child a grown-up told you they were going to do something for you but they didn't and you found out later that they never intended to do it. Remember applying for a job and not getting it? What about making a proposal of marriage and being rejected? We have all felt rejected by those we knew, those that should have cared, but didn't. Our self-esteem has been damaged, but for the most part, we have learned to overcome the rejection and move on with life. Christ can offset those rejections and all the hurtful things that people say and do to you. Christ himself said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. As you walk with Christ, you must suffer many things and be rejected. Yes, rejection and suffering hurts, but always remember that your heavenly goal is well worth the earthly hurt. In the book of James we read, Blessed is the man who endures trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. <laughs> 